In terms of the audience, is there, is there a broad agreement with, with, with the analysis? Or is there anyone who, who, who would regard this as being flawed, would like to challenge it? If you go back to the 60s and 70s, when you invested in a company, and, and bearing in mind you may have bought the share from somebody else, but let's assume you have invested directly. When you bought a share, essentially that capital was invested in what was predominantly physical capital. Mm -hmm. So when you invested in General Motors or, or General Dynamics, and, and Friedman may have got a you know, it may have been a victim of his time. If we look at the value chain at the moment, increasingly value in the value chain derives from ideas and brands. Mm -hmm. In an experiential society mm -hmm. where you pay three and four dollars for a cup of coffee and a thousand dollars for a phone, mm -hmm. the bulk of that value comes from the idea and the brand. Mm -hmm. Net operating cash flow is a very poor leading indicator of the value of a brand right. or an idea right. because those ideas and brands are subject to impairment immediately, mm -hmm. as in the case of BP. Mm -hmm. When you ran the South Sea Island, South Sea Company, and you invested in a franchise to exploit, you know, cocoa oil yeah. or something. It was a physical asset which couldn't explode right. or implode immediately. Mm -hmm. The challenge with the modern corporation is that it is subject to enormous impairment on its key assets, which mm -hmm. are ideas and brands. Mm -hmm. And those are the companies that are able to communicate the value of those brands long term right. in the form yeah. of compelling rhetoric mm -hmm. and underlying sure. information. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. get subjected to mm -hmm. marauding anarchy of the marketplace. Right. So the argument may be is that shareholder value is not so much that the flaws with shareholder value, it's that the mechanism that we use, which is net operating cash flows discounted, mm -hmm. are a poor leading indicator of that. Mm -hmm. The final observation, I think John Colvin's point, the average share might be held for 20 minutes, but the median share isn't. Right, yeah. yeah. And the other issue is around um, Shareholder value maximization, we may not see evidence of it mm -hmm. because directors aren't doing that. Directors are satisficing and therefore you're not getting the outcome that mm -hmm. you think you get mm -hmm. because they're not looking for that outcome, right. they're actually satisficing. Mm -hmm. Trying to go backwards, um, but on the evidence point, the way they test this is they look at uh, rule changes, governance rules within the firm and so they try and see if you institute a rule change. For example, if you go from a staggered board where a third of the directors are elected each year to a non-staggered board, thereby making it easier for a hedge fund to come in and challenge. Does that improve share value? And so that's the way they're measuring it. And, and I think, I, so I'll actually defend the lack of any empirical results as being significant because without regard to what the directors want to do, you would think that making it easier to remove them would promote greater shareholder value if the principal problem were that shareholders didn't have enough control. Um, I love your example of brand names. Um, and in fact, if you look at the industries where corporations first arose, that's exactly the sort of economic project where you see corporations being used most often, where you need to make a long-term commitment to something that if you can't hold it together, the value evaporates very quickly. Actually, I, I think a brand name and a railroad are very similar. Uh, the thing about a railroad is in order to get any money out of it, you need to have all of it. You need to have both of the tracks. You need to have the beginning and the end. <laughs> you need to have the rail, you know, the rail cars. And it's the same thing with a brand name. It's a long-term investment. And indeed, um, if, you can, if you can get a short-term increase in price um, by doing things that erode the value of the brand name, but this doesn't show up in market price immediately, uh, yeah, that's going to be a very tempting opportunity for someone to fish with dynamite. We've actually just seen this in the US. Um, we have a very famous hedge fund raider, Carl Icahn, who went after Clorox, which is one of the oldest and most established uh, you know, bleach brands in the United States. And of course, what he wanted to do was break it up and bust it up in the hopes that he would get a temporary share price um, uh, increase. Uh, Clorox was able to fend him off in part because the United States doesn't have a takeovers panel. But, uh, but it, was a, it, was a, it was a bitter fight and it's an example of the sorts of pressures that uh, companies that are trying to develop brand names for the future have to resist. Well, th there are two things that are, are, are semi-formed thoughts that I have yeah. that I'd like to throw into this mix. Um, the first is whether or not, perhaps because many of us are lawyers, we jump too often to legal solutions to problems. And um, I've heard it a lot in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And as a result of seeking legal solutions to lots of problems, mm -hmm. we have, for instance, reverse onus of proof around forward-looking statements mm -hmm. for people who want to tell the market what their plan mm -hmm. is, which is producing for many companies, um, and in particular for directors, 
a very perverse incentive to say as little as they Pass can mm -hmm. um, because they're going to get sued. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder about whether or not we do need to look more to the sorts of solutions that, in fact, people like the Takeovers Panel, the ASX Corporate Governance Council and other such organisations which look to principles mm -hmm. rather than to simple, direct legal solutions, mm -hmm. where we have created a so much more complex society than mm -hmm. we had 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the next thing I want to move on to. Because so much of this conversation, at very many levels, could have been held 50 years ago yes. in talking about the form of director's duties, mm -hmm. um, the fact of a corporation. But in fact, what we now have is corporations of a size that are not only too big to fail, but in many cases, too big to manage. Mm -hmm. So quite contrary to what you're saying about the role of the takeovers panel in the UK, yeah. we may have created through looking at the simple um, rationalist models, yeah. organisations that are so big mm -hmm. that we can't rationally manage them without mm -hmm. modelling, mm -hmm. which involves a whole range of assumptions that you only find out too late were wrong. We're wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the GFC leads you to perhaps some of that analysis. Mm -hmm. um, the case of only having four large auditing firms in the world leads to mm -hmm. that anal analysis. Mm -hmm. Were you a government 20 years ago looking at some of those mergers, knowing what you know now, you might have said no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think some of our analysis needs to go back to um, the people, mm -hmm. not the models, mm -hmm. uh, to principles rather than simple legal solutions, mm -hmm. and indeed to do some unpicking of some of the laws that we now have right. yeah. and rethinking around mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. to allow franker conversations mm -hmm. um, in markets and among people about prospects for firms. Very much. Justin, can I yeah. just make a comment about that? I, I'd add one other thing, and that is I think we've moved into a period in Australia where the articulation of policy and the making of good law has uh, fallen away. I think that we see as lawyers again and again, if you take your example of the reverse onus of proof type mm -hmm. provision, uh, not enough thoughtfulness about the policy making process and not enough thoughtfulness about the actual laws we have and the new laws we're making. Uh, I mean, say, th there doesn't seem to be enough time and enough close consideration mm -hmm. given to a lot of our lawmaking mm -hmm. uh, about what it really is going to do. Uh, Can I just make a quick follow-up to your point, too? Uh, it, it's not always best to think about this as generating legal solutions to mm. problems or indeed market solutions mm. to problems. The word trust is, I think, extraordinarily important. Mm. Uh, the, the, if you ask, and, and this relates to your admirable attempt to put our problem in a simple way by thinking of the firm as something that generates surplus. Yeah. Think carefully about what that means. You are, I'm, imagining driving through the city of Bristol, which I know well, past the great Bristol Hospital. And you ask, do the doctors in that hospital think that their task is to generate surplus for the Bristol Hospital? And of course not. Mm. Uh, uh, so if we're going to go with the surplus idea, uh, they're generating surplus well beyond the hospital. They're not doing something which you can capture in a market solution. You, guess what Adam Smith's other great book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, is all about building connections, that, building a health service that people trust in a community that respects its doctors. Mm. Those two words, trust and respect. And those, um, a, 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 and I come back to my professionalization idea, I think those th professionalization, trust, respect and integrity of those that work in firms, the more these things are possible, the less we will need legal solutions. Uh, 
the law being there is necessary, but as, as one of you said, the more these things are important, the less we will end up colliding with the law and needing mm. to fix it that way. Yeah. Okay. Dean Sanders. Great. In, in fact, that's a, that's a great introduction to, to my topic. Dean Sanders, FPA and Chief Professional Officer for this particular, that particular community. Sorry for the voice, but um, I want to tease out that theme a little bit too because I, I, I thoroughly support uh, the pr Professor Stout's hypothesis around the idea that the corporation is almost the perfect vehicle of disaggregation. And I think, in fact, that's, that's what we're really talking about here. Now, I'm hearing, I, I, I step away, though, from the idea of legal solution, as I think most people are, mm -hmm. and through even the idea of better law. I think we argue that there is such a thing as better law. I actually am concerned that, in fact, what we're really trying to respond to is the concept of disaggregation. We've all, we have all disaggregated our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We all assume it's somebody else's issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, further law yeah. actually just inculcates that further because we create greater legal professionals, we, we a community of compliance professionals, somebody else <laughs> to be responsible for administering the law. Mm -hmm. So I'm deeply attracted to Professor Vine's idea about professionalisation, which happens right. to be an area of personal interest, mm -hmm. because it is about the idea of how we hold each other accountable. Yeah. And I think that the duty to the corporation as a director misunderstands the duty to hold each other director yeah, mm -hmm. responsible, yeah, 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 right. which I think is part of the challenge we have in our, in our mm -hmm. corporate governance structures. But, but fa fabulous, uh, fabulous discussion. Thank you. Behind Very difficult. So as I'm, I'm walking it's over, it seems yeah. a bit churlish to come so close to Christmas. But uh, but I mean, is is it part of the lawyer's role to deconstruct or or, or um, forget about fables, John? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think there are many fables out there, and I think we do. And is shareholder value one of them? Well, I think it has been deconstructed to a large degree in Australia in recent times. Uh, mm -hmm. it, from a lawyer's point of view, as to in terms of how the duty is to be framed, mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I'm not sure about the actual practice of it. And I think right. there's a lot of evidence that the shareholder does reign. Mm -hmm. My my big problem is who who are they? Um, mm -hmm. these, I mean, say quite often they're really investment managers who are operating under a mandate who tell a custodian how to vote the shares. Um, mm. And those shares are moving around. As I think I'm not sure who mentioned, you know, they're being lent or they're being borrowed. Mm. Um, you know, the whole idea of the share is is sort of being blown up. Mm. And the real interest is the ultimate person who has the economic interest in the in the outcomes. It doesn't get a vote. It doesn't get a vote, <laughs> and, and quite often is. Or if he does get it, often doesn't bother to cast it. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> you know, the movement of democracy in, in, in terms of uh, more involvement of the big uh, superannuation funds and things like that, having regard to the interests of their members, yeah. is quite an important one. Yeah. It's happened in Canada. It hasn't happened mm -hmm. here. But I mean, I, as I said, I think the emergence of basically economic, uh, sorry, of social rep responsibility reporting, environmental reporting, you know, the whole sustainability report, you know, this whole thing, I, I think that's a massive change in thinking that that's happening at the moment. I, I think that's sort of consistent yeah. with a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah. So I, I think we're there. I think we're it's there. A, it's, it sounds it's like you're ahead of us. I think, I think, well, no, I think, I think the world is there. I think that... that, that I think it, we're potentially there. Well, I think, yeah. well, I think if no, you look at... No, we're not there in the at, US yet. I hate oh, to be okay. the bearer of bad news. We're not there in the US <laughs> but I, yet. But I do think, you know, you ask, as I said, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, this, you know, sustainability reporting yeah. and even auditing of sustainability reporting. So... And I think that's reflecting a, a, a community expectation, frankly. Yeah. I, I have to say... Greg, I, I know you have to, to, yeah, to, to leave. Uh, I have to be accountable to... I'm enthusiastic about that actual result because if it's more reporting and more direct liability for getting any of the reports wrong, you're going to have exactly the mm. same problem mm. that Cathy's yeah. already mm. raised. Mm. And you're actually not yeah. going to move the morals and the mm. ethics. Mm. Uh, but if, uh, if it's a, yeah. a, a mm. thought process mm. and a principles-based mm. issue about this and what's discussed, then I think it's a very good... Well, I, I, so I, I'm not looking at mandating it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just in case before I, I, you left. No, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, actually, as I said, I think, I think it's actually reflecting... I think companies are responding to community expectations, and yeah. some of the community expectations are what they're probably getting back from institutional shareholders uh, and being you know, more accountable, not just focusing on on price or whatever. So I think I think we are seeing a change. That yeah. That's all. You have to okay. excuse me. Great. Thank Good you very much. Great. Great. Good to meet Steve you. Steve Mark. Okay. Uh, Steve Mark, Legal mm. Services Good Commissioner. Steve. Just Thank a you. short comment. Uh, I remember in 2008 when we had the first great financial meltdown 
Um, there was a, a wonderful moment when uh, our then Prime Minister uh, Kevin Rudd was over talking to Gordon Blair in the UK and they came out with a joint statement that they said what we really needed in regulating financial markets was to bring back family values. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about my family, that would be extremely frightening. <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to say about this is that, that uh, when we look at the concept of professionalism, the concept of ethics, um, there, there is one little model, it's a very small one, and Seamus mentioned it a bit, um, that, that, that we can actually think about, and that is that the fact that there are now two corporations listed on the stock exchange in Australia that have the primary duty to the community, not the shareholder, not even to the entity. And those are both law firms. This is, to <laughs> some extent, some people would find this very frightening. <laughs> but actually, it could be an incredibly yes. interesting model for a different type of regulation, not only a type of regulation, but a type of thinking about the role that the directors of an entity play. So then Slater and Gordon and integrated holdings, you have the primacy of the court, where the directors of those publicly lifted companies have their primary duty to the court, their secondary duty to their client, the tertiary duty to the shareholder. And if there's a court, and they all state that if there's a clash between corporations law and the Legal Profession Act, the Legal Profession Act will prevail leaving aside the small constitutional issue there, there's a, there's a really interesting concept behind that, which is that they have their duty to something bigger. And that is the whole basic concept of professionalism. To be a professional, you have to have a duty to the community, to the, yeah. to the public. Right. It's not just about having a specialized ethical knowledge. It's about your duty to the community. And there are very few professions if we make directors a profession in the same way that lawyers are the profession, perhaps that's, that's getting somewhere along that path. It's very interesting. Okay. Uh, now the regulators left. Can I ask the panel? Some of us. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh, thank you, Sir John. Can I ask the panel? Do they think the, reg the regulators are irresponsible in allowing? securities markets to allow publicly traded corporations to trade with constitutions which give absolute power to the directors to corrupt themselves, their business and the system by having in the regards to managing their own conflicts of interest which we're told directors should not have conflicts of interest mm -hmm. but as soon as you have a single board where the governance powers are combined with management powers yeah directors are forced to have the conflict of interest of determining their own pay, their own nomination, their own remuneration, and selecting and paying the judge of their accounts, which are basically an unethical, unethical structures, which could be eliminated by the separation of governance powers into a separate board from the management powers. So my thesis is regulators are irresponsible in allowing publicly traded corporations to have directors with absolute power. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Do you agree? No, probably <laughs> not. But I need to think about it some more. Um, the United States, uh, and of course that's the model I'm most familiar with, um, one of the most interesting things about the United States is that, first of all, it was the nation that, that first and most strongly developed what I think of as the truly public corporation, meaning a corporation without a controlling shareholder. Very unique structure, not common in the rest of the world. How did that happen? It happened because I hate to say this, God bless them, the plaintiff's lawyers were able to bring class actions and derivative actions and they didn't have to pay fees if they lost. And what that meant was the duty of loyalty in the United States is very rigorously enforced. So in the United States, it's actually not true that directors can use their powers to line their own pockets. They really can't. If a director enters a self-interested transaction, uh, they'll, be a, they'll be dragged into court immediately and if it's not on fair terms, they'll be sued successfully. So in a way, we've evolved something that ap actually operates more independently than what you see in boards of directors in the rest of the world. I'm a little fond of it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have room for improvement. But, but it's, a, it's a different experience from the rest of the world. Our directors really are pretty clean in the sense that they can't use their director's positions to make themselves wealthy. 
which is why they have room to think about other things, like professionalism, if we can just encourage them to do so. Well, okay. I'll, I'm happy to comment on that. I, I think that um, one of the things that's underestimated in Australia and, and probably the United States from the comments is that we have an incredibly good system of uh, training gov uh, directors and also I think at the top level of our companies um, they're about as good as anywhere else in the world. Um, in fact there's a good argument to say they're probably better than anywhere else in the world. Ethical issues are a c constant issue in boards. Um, doing the right thing is a constant debate in boards. Um, we have more laws, as I said, Shan, to make sure directors are liable and prosecuted mm -hmm. than probably any other country in the world. So it's probably dysfunctional because mm -hmm. the end argument I think that you're putting is that we must do something about it. Um, the best thing we can possibly do is attract the best very people, the best people. I don't mean that just in terms of economics, legal analysis and business, but in terms of you know, the best in terms of ethics, morals and, and also you know, judgment. Mm -hmm. And business judgment is critical because the business judgment that directors make on a you know, nearly a weekly basis is weighing up all the various things we've been talking about. Um, if you make that decision, is that going to be a reputational issue for the, com for the company later on, even if there's you know, large profits to be made? Um, I would suggest that most companies in Australia would always, just about always, take the view um, that that's not the right way to go. Um, it's I agree with what you're saying, but the point is you're overloading the duties of directors. We heard this from the corporation getting too big to manage. Yeah. Why overload the duties and add extra liabilities on them like the Centro case? And whereby separating, decomposing decision making labour to get away from the company. So I agree with everything you're saying. Oh, yeah. And but, I agree with what Lynn is saying, but except in Australia, you don't know what, the, there's no transparency, you don't know the law says that, but what they do in practice. We could always make life very yeah, well, simple by getting rid of the publicly suppose, listed company. The argument is <laughs> there's a lot of law on that, and there's a lot of discussion, a lot of about what is the role of a director, mm. and that ebbs and flows with tides and issues, um, which is also there's a lot of discussion about that. So if you're saying that you know. Um, people shouldn't look at directors, especially non-executive directors, and treat them as managers, you've got absolutely 100% support. Um, if you're talking about you know, what is the role of a director on a given day, I mean, I think most of the boards in the last year, the last couple of years, have probably worked harder than they've ever worked, and they've probably turned to, you know, I mean, you hear about REM committee meetings, NOM committee meetings, mm -hmm. audit and risk committee meetings, meeting every day, you know, for you know, long periods of time. Um, Everyone in this audience probably knows about some aspects yeah. of that. So that ebbs and flows. I have a, a you know a pretty strong view personally that trying to draw lines um, other than the general principle lines is quite dysfunctional. Okay, I think at that we'll we'll leave the formal proceedings. Uh, coffee is available uh, outside, but at this stage I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, Professor Lynn Stark from UCLA uh, and for our distinguished thank panel: you. John thank Morgan, James so Miller, yeah. John Coven, David Fine.